All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome. Today is November the 10th, 2020. Thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Marvin Bennett Show. Um, as usual, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for allowing us to see you another day. God, we ask you, God, that you would continue to help us as individuals. We ask you, God, that you would heal our land as we cry out to you for change, oh God. And oh God, once again, we just thank you for this opportunity of this day that you allowed us to see, which means that you gave us a chance to make a different choice. And we appreciate it and we thank you for it. We ask you, God, that we, we use this, that you will use this episode to be a blessing to your children and your people. And I hope that it brings healing and help to someone that's struggling or whatever the case may be as they listen to this young lady's testimony on this evening. We thank you in advance and give your name all the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' mighty and master's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, Amen. So before we get the show started, I got two things I want to get off my chest um, before we go in. Because once we start the interview, once I start the interview with tonight's guest, I want the Lord to have his way to move how we want to move. Um, I got two things I want to get off my chest before we start the show, though. Uh, one is spiritual. One is personal. Um, first, I want to give a shout out to Sharon Clark, my peoples, my fam. Thank you for all the smiles. Happy born day today. I got my cousin that has a birthday today. Happy born day. Um, and I want to salute all the veterans. Happy Veteran Day, early Veterans Day to all the veterans. To all my family, all my friends, all my Facebook friends that have served in the military, we appreciate you. I also salute you and thank you for your services. Um, and know that you guys and your families are always continually in my prayer. But it does your what did you do does, does not go unnoticed. So I wanted to get that. Um, all right. So the first thing I wanted to get off my my chest spiritually was um, September 29th. Now, let me disclaim this before I begin, before I say what I say. I'm not saying that God Almighty spoke to me and told me anything is specific, but I feel a, a need of who I am in God to share this publicly because of the way that it weighs on me spiritually. Um, I, I did not watch any of the debates. Um, and I've been seeing on my timeline how people celebrating and everybody's excited because Trump been voted out. We got Biden and Ms. Harris coming into office. But on September 29th, I did not watch any of the debates. I haven't watched any of the debates, period. Um, the most I've seen of the debates is SNL skits. <laughs> but on, the on September 29th, during that debate, President, President Trump, he said they tried to get him to denounce white supremacy in a particular group called the Proud Boys. OK. Um, what he did was he didn't he never really denounced them. He said that I whatever what he said was um, I'm willing to do whatever I say, whatever. Who, who, who do you want me to address? This is what his words were to the moderator. Who do you want me to address? And they specifically said to the, the Proud Boy. And his response was not that he denounced them. But his response was stand back and stand by. And I seen it on my timeline, all up down my timeline the very next day and wasn't really sure what was going on until I did some research and I asked some people what was it, what was it related to. And they told me it was what he said during the debate. Now, being from the street, there is a, there's a certain language that we speak, that we can speak amongst ourselves and understand each other perfectly where we can have a conversation in front of police, so to speak, but they don't have any idea what we're talking about in this context. Um, when I seen that, the first thing that I thought was, what in the world does stand back and stand by mean? For some reason, it struck like a spider sense in me, like, you know, that tingly feeling like, what? for some reason, it drew my attention. And I wonder what was the significance of stand back and stand by? Um, if you're a praying individual and you're watching this, people, we need to pray now like never before because, yeah, Trump has been voted out, but I've never served a day in the military whatsoever in my life. But being from the streets, 
when I hear stand back and stand by, what I hear is an order or a command. Mm -hmm. Now, I knew I was going to want to share this or talk about this on the beginning of the show tonight. So I looked up. I looked it up who the Proud Boys were. And they're the so-called leader, Enrique Terrio. I seen a report where he said that the Proud Boys rescinded the order. These are his words, not mine. They rescinded the order from President Trump to stand by after he was voted out. Now, people, I'm not telling you what to believe. You can think to yourself. Like, but just because somebody say that something is in existence does not mean that it exists. For one, before I knew what it was, I, I, I thought it was particular that I, I took it as an order or a command, military style. And for the here that this leader of this particular group, the Proud Boys, say that the order has been rescinded. People, this thing is not over. We don't know what's, what can happen between now and January when Biden is actually swore in. We don't know if these people are laying in wait. So be prayerful, be mindful, and be safe out here. You got to protect your family. You got to protect yourself. And at the end of the day, listen, I don't know what your religious beliefs are, but at the end of the day, we all believe in a creator. Unless you're atheist, you believe in something. You believe in a higher power. Whatever it is that you believe in, now is the ultimate time for you to be tapping into that to get uh, direction discernment and to be alert and to be aware. So I just wanted to put that out there because I want my people to be safe and I want my people to be my people that are spiritual. I want you to be to be praying about these things because we don't know what can happen. You know, we don't know what can happen. Yeah, Trump is gone, but he still got 30 days left where he's the man. We don't we don't know what's going on behind the scene. The same way them cops don't understand understand the conversation that we was having before them. I understand that you're saying that you rescinded the order, but there's a select group, which means that there's a select group that knew about this order. That wasn't public information for everybody. So we don't still we still don't know what they have in the works behind the scene. That's all I'm saying. Be prayerful, be mindful, and be very cautious. Um and so that that's all on that. Um, okay, on a personal level, um, and I don't usually do this, but I wanted to do this so I could nip it at the bud in the beginning. You got people that are petty. I mean, you got people that are petty and you got people that are messy. Okay. I'm, I admit it. I'm the king of petty. I consider myself to be very petty. I could be petty at times. I have no problem. I'm not ashamed of that. I own it. That's me. I can be petty. But the one thing that I don't do is I don't do messy. Okay. Um, my ex-wife and I are not social media friends. We are not friends. So whatever she does, that is her. I personally tell people all the time, um, marriage is especially depending on the time and the history. It is a life, in my opinion. It's a whole nother life. It's a whole nother creation. When I got my divorce, I grieved just like I would the loss of a loved one or anybody else that was close to me. I grieved her and I grieved my marriage. Am I bitter? No. Am I devastated? No. Am I hurt? No. Am I happy? I'm not nothing. I feel nothing. So to the people that really care about me and I know that really love me and that reach out to me and call and text me to check on me to make sure that I'm okay, I'm fine because I don't, I literally don't feel anything. I'm not bitter. I'm not angry. I'm not anything because that chapter of my life is over. So that's the only way I, I want to address that now because I know some people will be messy. Well, did you see that she got engaged or whatever case may be? 
that has no bearing on me whatsoever. I just want to put that out there. But for the people that are really concerned about me and worry, Marv is good. I'm absolutely fine. You know what I mean? I don't wish her no ill will. I don't feel bitter. I don't I don't feel hurt. I don't feel any of that. Like I've grieved that part of my life. So whatever she do is what she do. Now I'm not gonna go over the top like no movie and say, well, you know, I wish her all the best. Nobody that you ever spend the expect to spend the rest of your life with, do you want to see happy without you, so to speak? But that don't mean I want to see her fail. You know, I've been seeing a lot of posts where people say, you know, you can forgive someone or you can move on and not never speak to that person, but it don't mean that you feel no type of way. And that's perfectly and honestly true. I don't feel any kind of way. So whatever she does is what she does. Now, to all you messy people, I address this now because I don't want to address it in the future. Don't be sending me no screenshots. Don't be texting me, asking me no questions pertaining to her. I don't know anything about her. Any questions you have for her, you ask her. You see what I'm saying? I don't do messy. So I want to nip that at the bud from the, off the jump. So I'm telling you now, don't bring none of that messy stuff my way because I, I'm not going to put my Jesus down. But guess what? I'm going to cuss you out. And I'm telling you that ahead of time. You know what I'm saying? Don't bring no messy stuff my way because I don't do it. With that being said, let's start the show. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm super, super excited about tonight, guests. This is a young lady that I had the privilege of going to church with. And I told you, I, I usually do like a pre announcement show picture. And I can't, I was looking through my phone. I actually seen a picture of us together from the uh, You're Going Away party. And I was like, I don't, oh, I don't yeah. ever like to use none of those pictures there. But I always, that picture always was symbolic to me or personal to me because mm -hmm. I never forget that day. For one, it was the first time that I kind of somewhat came out of my shell and was doing a function with the church people outside of my normal so-called so circle, okay. you know. And it was like the first time that we ever had a conversation, mm -hmm. I would say physically. Like mm -hmm. you were always, it was something about you that drew me to you where I would pray for you. I didn't have to know your name. It was just something about you, your your being, your entity that was like, okay, she's a real one. And you're supposed to keep her covered in prayer. And I do that, I do that randomly with a lot of people, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't have to have a conversation with you. I don't have to let you know that you're in my prayers or you're in my thoughts or whatever the case may be, unless right. I share it. I just need to do it if that's what I'm led to do. And right. you were one of those people. So I remembered it because, like I said, you were moving the west. I believe you that's when you were going to go to Texas. Mm -hmm. yeah. We got to have a conversation and, you know, it was, it was pretty profound. I'm quite sure you don't even remember it, but I was like, it, it stuck with me. And you had a post, I think it was about maybe two weeks ago, where you kind of gave a little bit of your testimony and talked about some of the things that you've been through. And it was so, I, I want to say I was so proud of you. Mm. I was so godly proud. Because mm. one of the things that people don't understand is when we, when we talk in ministry is, this is something that I had to learn on a personal level, which we all do. But one of the things before, before my divorce and everything else, one of the things that I always thank God Almighty for, for was, he warned me. He told me, I am going to take you through a Job experience. Mm. And I'm like, mm. huh? I'm not trying to be nobody. I'm not trying mm. to be no preacher. I'm just a regular dude. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I acknowledge the fact that I love you. Why I got to lose everything? You know what I mean? Mm. I don't understand mm. that. Lord, mm. like, oh, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to sign up to be in the service like that. I just want to have a relationship with you. <laughs> I don't want to go all in. That's just me being real. And mm, one of the things yeah. that he told me was, he said, listen, you're going to lose everything, but just mm. like Joe, you're going to get back everything that you need. Mm, yeah. And no matter how bumpy it may get, no matter mm. how weary it may look, I'm with you. Rest assured, mm -hmm. I know that I'm with you. 
And that gave me the confidence to say, you know what, no matter what comes my way, I got the strength, even if I don't realize it at this particular moment, I do have the strength within me to endure whatever those obstacles is because God gave me that assurance. Yeah. And mm -hmm. One of the things that he told me was, like, for me to be who I want to be, and because at the end of the day, the only thing I really want to do is please God with my life. I wanted mm -hmm. to I stand before God on judgment day. I wanted to be able to say, I did exactly what it is that you created me to do. Yeah. No matter how I may look mm -hmm. the people, you know what I mean? Right. It's not about right. in front of thousands of folks and all that case, baby. If you got me in the area, in the area to do something else, because I could go sit down and have conversations with kingpins mm -hmm. in an atmosphere where everybody smoked out and lead right. somebody to Christ. Right. And T.D. Jakes can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know that, That's not no merit to myself. I'm just saying that right. we all have to be comfortable in our own callings and our own surroundings and what God called us to do. And yeah. one of the things that he told me was, you're going to have to be transparent. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think that a lot of Christians suffer with, whether you was a hoe, whether you was a drug dealer, whether you was a murderer, whatever your case may be, whether you was a meth head, it's like when God delivers us and we come to Christ and he delivers us, he said all things are new. So we become a new creature. Yep. That's one of mm -hmm. the reasons that I don't like the whole AAC and saying when they start the meeting, well, I'm, I'm Juan Marvin and I'm an alcoholic. No, because God said I'm a new creature. I used to be an alcoholic, but I'm no longer an alcoholic. So I'm not claiming that because right. there is power in word. You know, the power of yeah. life is in the tongue. So, but with that being said, you know, with that transparency part, a lot of us, we thank God for where he's brought us from but we don't want to share with the world because we still deal with the shame or we still deal with the guilt. And a mm -hmm. big part of, of true deliverance is finding a way to get comfortable in that being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, and when I read yeah. your post, it was like, wow, she mm -hmm. has, it. she's putting everything out there. She's not worried about being judged. She's not worried mm -hmm. about making mistakes. She's put it out there just like it is raw. And I was like, I have to have her on the show. So mm. with that being said, I Appreciate have Miss um, Tamika Marie. She's an author. She's a mother. Um, single, single, right? Uh, sure. Why okay. not? I mean, I, I mean, we, we won't. Life is yeah, I mean, we ain't got to go right? there. So you're right. <laughs> <laughs> we we so ain't got to go wife, there. Future wife, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. there, you, there you go, future wife. I like that. Um, so Tamika, just introduce yourself to the people and um, make sure you let them definitely before the show is over, if now, at the end, whenever, let them know about your books, uh, the titles, where they could get them from, you know, promote your product, why you have here. But tell a little bit of people, tell a little bit, the people a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay, well, I am Tamika Marie first. Marvin, thank you so much for having me. Thank Absolutely. you for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Um, well, as Marvin already stated, that I'm a writer, I'm an author, um, I'm an author of the My Life, My Story, God's Glory series, um, where literally the Lord led me to write. That's period. That's the entire testimony. Wrote my first book in 2018. It's a memoir series, and the second one that followed in 2019. And I'm still pinning to this day here in 2020. So I'm an author, writer, mother to my beautiful twin daughters. And I'm called to ministry in the marketplace right now until the Lord says otherwise. Okay. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> and what's the title of your book? Uh, the first one is Giving Beauty for Ashes and the other is Crazy Faith. Beauty. And they what was the first one again? Giving Beauty for Ashes. Given beauty for ashes. Okay. And then the second one, Crazy Faith. And they're all on Amazon. Are you from, are you from the Minnesota area, right? I am. Well, I'm originally from Chicago, but was raised in Minnesota. Okay. Okay. And how old were you when you left Chicago? I was, how old was I? I was nine. I was nine. So whole family is from Chicago. Um, it came from a broken household. Mom was on drugs when I was the age of three, got into a foster home until we were six years old. My mom 
beat her drug addiction and she got us out the foster home at the age of nine and then she had relocated us to Minnesota where she had already moved forward in life had remarried and had two other children and so we have been in Minnesota ever since okay yeah now you now did you say did I hear you correctly did you say your mom your mom was on drugs at the time when she left you got when you, when you guys left she was mm -hmm. okay now, if you don't mind me asking you, what what the, what kind of that condition had on you years later when you actually became a mom yourself? Yeah, I mean, it's so crazy because so I've always looked at my mom's situation as a a strength because for any woman who has the strength in her to say, you know, I'm gonna beat this addiction and then come for her kids who were not supposed to be in a foster home, that alone to me, I had always seen strength in my mom, not the weakness that she had fell into drugs, but I had seen her strength that she overcame it. And so to be quite honest, it didn't have a huge effect on me. Yes, me and my younger sibling were in the foster home for three years, but as we'll get further into my testimony, Chicago, as you know, probably that is big. And mm -hmm. so me and my sister ended up in my uncle's girlfriend's grandmother's home as a foster home. And Chicago is huge. We could have made, we could have been in anybody's house. And we ended up with my uncle's girlfriend's grandmother. And so once she realized she had my mom's kids, she contacted my uncle and let him know that she had my mother's children and she was able to come and visit us. And really, I think that's what gave her the strength to really fight to get us back. So I, I I really don't look at it as it really did a huge damage on me when I was in that in there because like I said I look at it as a strength more than a than a weakness. She overcame that. And and that, and that that's really a testament to who you are, and how you allow God to give you grace in the situation. Absolutely. Because this this is not the first time I've heard this type of story, but this is the first time that I've heard nobody not have any hostility or you know, feel some kind of way or use it as a crush or, you know, my daddy wasn't there or my mama was strung out. But no, at the end of the day, I still love him because at the end of the day, regardless, the Bible tells us, you know, respect your mother and your father at the end of the Absolutely. day. And I yeah. tell people all the time, you know, despite how you may feel about your parents, without your parents, point blank, period, you wouldn't be here to feel no type of way. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you can feel however you want to feel about them, but you gotta show them that still you still gotta give them that level of respect to because without them, you wouldn't be here, period. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you said you said that you was gonna get more into that. We was gonna get more into that as a testimony. So what what was what was let, let me ask you this? Okay, so you we we, we talked off camera a little bit yesterday, but um mm -hmm. you said you was your upbringing. Like what was, mm -hmm. what, what years were, well, how old were you when you actually left Chicago? I was nine. So I was nine right. when my mom came and got us officially um, mm -hmm. from Chicago and brought us to Minnesota. And so she raised us in Minnesota um, and my upbringing. So like I stated that my mom had already started a new life. She had beat her addiction, moved to Minnesota from Chicago, remarried, had two other children and I'm the oldest of my mom's kids. And so, when she relocated us to Minnesota, I had two siblings that I didn't know about. And so automatically I became the oldest of not only the one who was in the foster home with me, but two others. And then not only that, I know we were talking about how um, our parents' conditions, not using it as a crutch. Well, my father died when I was young. He died when I was three, which was a major part of why my mom fell into a drug addiction. And so mm -hmm. not having my biological father in my life Yes, me and my siblings having a father that created a form of envy in my heart, jealousy rather, in, in where I lashed out on my siblings at times. And so that did have a major part on me in my upbringing. And so um, with, even though he was there as a stepfather, I still watched him and my mother's marriage in a way where, I mean, he drank a lot and so they fought a lot. So that was a lot of my childhood was watching them fight, breaking up fights you know what I'm saying and mm -hmm. so that was the environment that I grew up in and yeah but she eventually left and that was by the time I was in high school though but um yeah remarried again and yeah so that was us in Minnesota <laughs> wow yeah 
so so what 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 was what was being um all right so so let me ask you this i know like for me it was culture shock leaving uh 80 percent black city in north new jersey mm -hmm. going to little rock arkansas mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. arkansas wasn't as white as i thought it would be but it was a big difference it was it was literally culture shock because it was a different way of living living a different mentality a different way of going about things all that did what was it like mm -hmm. going from D Chicago to Minnesota? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was a kid, so I was nine. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I don't think I really saw that big culture shock. But, you know, I guess we'll talk about that a little later. The culture shock was when I moved from Minnesota to North Carolina. <laughs> okay. That was the culture shock. You know, Minnesota, like you said, we're the minority in Minnesota. And so moving to North Carolina where i mean i saw a lot of us i mean especially in in professional positions like in minnesota you rarely saw a black doctor you rarely i don't think i ever met a black principal until i got to north carolina so that's where the culture shock was for me but in chicago i was too young to remember that all right mm -hmm. so but what was what was it like you were too young to really know the difference, but as far as like school right. and high school and everything like that, as far as Minnesota, you said mm -hmm. that, it, like, I would imagine, I'm not sure, but I would imagine that the population in Minnesota is not 50-50. Right, right, right. So, yeah. like, how, how was that, like, for you adapting in high school and, you know, just a different way of life? Mm hmm Yeah, so for me, how do I? I think because we moved to one of the black area, you know, a lot of times a lot of black people kind of migrate to the same area when gotcha. you move to a different state. Yeah. So I was still around a lot of us, you know, and, and we lived in St. Paul at the time. And so it was still a lot of us. I didn't, um, it didn't have a huge effect on me mm -hmm. um, because I, like I said, I was still around a lot of us and I have a big family as well. And so I went to school with cousins. And so it wasn't a huge effect when it comes gotcha. to culture wise. Yeah. You still had a core, mm -hmm. core, set, core, core group there. Right. Gotcha. So talk about that little culture side that you were talking about, though. What was that culture side like for you leaving Minnesota, coming to North Carolina? And, and yeah. what stage in your life was this? Yeah, so I had, um, so I have not always been saved, right? The Lord saved me in my bathtub at the age of 27, where I had a black and mouth and a four loco beer in my hand. And during that what kind time, of beer? What kind of beer now? A four loco. Four loco. I, I don't know that one. Oh, that may be a Minnesota thing. <laughs> <laughs> but right. uh, he saved me in my bathtub. And when that transition happened, one of the desires he gave in my and gave to me was to move and that move was actually to texas and um during that time a cousin of mine had come into my life and she was already going to church and was a praise dancer you know and she was really um one of those family members where everybody thought she was holier than thou you know that that term and so mm -hmm. she invited me to church with her and um i would go with her off and on and then when, like I said, the Lord saved me, I started, I had this hunger to go more consistently. It was as if like he had his hand on me, like, like, yeah, you go, go, go. So I was learning more about him, hungry for him, got baptized again, and just really, he did a transformation in my life. And like I said, during that time, I had a desire to move. And so did she, my cousin, but her desire was to move to North Carolina. And so she asked me to come and visit. Now, if you know anything about Minnesota, we got snow like up to the window, like no exaggeration, no exaggeration. Mm -hmm. And so I had come to visit North Carolina with her in the middle of January. And we were landing in the middle of January from snow up to the window, Minnesota, and landing in North Carolina with no snow in sight. I mean, beautiful trees. The weather was beautiful. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's this place? I'm over here. So uh -huh. <laughs> that's how I got to North Carolina. Okay. And so from there, yeah. And so, like I said, when, when we got to North Carolina and I have twin daughters, we um, needed to get them enrolled in school. And that was the first thing I saw. Their principal was black. And I had never, like I said, I had never encountered that before. 
And then, you know, as we co continue to get acclimated, you know, seeing physicians that are Black, I was working in the medical field at the time. So I'm working with Black physicians and it was just beautiful to see it in all this Black culture. You know, you go dur downtown Durham, right? You hear about all the historical, um, you know, the history of Durham in so many of the Black owned shops that I saw when we first came to visit. It was just beautiful to me. And it was a beautiful culture shop, you know? And gotcha. so, it, yeah, yeah, it was beautiful. So you had your daughters in Minnesota before you came to North Carolina? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm, 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 I'm kind of all over the place. I, I want to hear <laughs> more about that. Though. I want I want to hear about this experience with the beer, the loco, and the black and mild, and the, in the, in the tub. How, how did, mm. what, like, what, 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 what was, give me a backdrop of that situation. Was it just another day? Was it mm. that you were already, did you feel the, the tugging on your spirit, so to speak? Like, mm -hmm. tell me the backdrop of that, that particular incident. Yeah. So I had been in a relationship for over six years and was engaged for three years. And um, you were sharing uh, during your earlier conversation before we started that, um, you know, you you can't, t you as far as you knowing or believing that you will be with a certain person for the rest of your life. I was in a relationship where you couldn't have told me that we wouldn't have grew old on our, in our rocking chairs, you know, watching our grandkids run around. That was the type of relationship it was. And, you know, we, we were thriving, you know, I'm working. He was a hustler. I'm gonna be honest. He was in the streets, you know, he was, um, he was, you know, a drug dealer in the streets, but I was working and, um, just, it, and I knew that it wasn't a great situation, but at the same time, I loved them. Right. And this was the man that I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life with. Well, things had hit rock bottom. Um, he ended up going to prison for five years, ended up a single mom, did not see that coming. Um, could no longer afford the home that I was living in. Uh, had been into a car accident, hit and run accident at that. And just everything, I just felt like everything was falling to pieces. And I found myself in this tub, you know, and during that time, that's where I was. I wasn't saved. I was, uh, again, I was a black and mild smoker. I was a beer drinker. And I just remember being in that bathtub, just crying, just thinking about everything that I'm about to lose this house that I didn't have the support that I had anymore. I got these three-year-old twin daughters I need to take care of. And I was just in a bad place. Now, let me just say this. I was also going to church off and on with my cousin. I would okay. go with her when I didn't have a hangover. Sometimes I wouldn't if I had a hangover. So it was kind of that off and on thing. But unknowingly, I didn't know that God was piercing my heart. And so I found myself in the bathtub at like one o'clock in the morning, Marvin, like just just like I said, just crying, just kind of drowning in my sorrows, if you will. And I remember just all these thoughts just come to me, like you're a bad mom, you're you're a bad fiance, just all, just battle, battle of the mind and just sitting in that bathtub, just crying. But the only thing that I can, I can't give no credit, but to God, as I sat in that tub, it was as if those thoughts ceased. It, they just ceased. Mm. And in that moment, I got up. I got up out the tub and like I said, it was early, it was early in the morning, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. And I walked over to my laptop. Now I had been in the medical field for years. I had never written, didn't have desire to. I read books, but I never thought to be a writer. I walked over to my laptop, opened my laptop, and I just started typing, 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 typing. Just typing, 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 typing. And 12 pages later, three hours later. I looked and, and I had written about my life. I had been writing about my life and I didn't understand why I had did that in that moment. So I shut my laptop. But from that moment, my life has never been the same, has never been the same. From that moment, I started going to church more and I was desiring the presence of God more and really just on fire. As I said, it was as if his hand was on me. And so, yeah, that's that's where I was in that moment. Now I'm real curious. You don't have to say if you want to, but is the, is the cousin that you're talking about Nisi? No, it's not. Nisi. No, okay. it's Cici. Cici, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a beautiful thing. So, what? Okay, so you come out the tub that night. Next day, how how does life anew after you finish typing those twelve pages? How does life anew begin? For you, so to speak. Yeah, 
so it wasn't obviously like oh my goodness everything is put back together the next day right mm -hmm. but it it gave me a, a greater perspective because I knew that God was with me but not only that as I continued to grow like like I said I just had this hunger and I was going to new members class I was going to church and I just I, I would honestly see supernatural things going on in my own life where I was just like wow Lord okay you're real for real um and I was just having these encounters these encounters that God will allow me to have and then as I continued to grow in him it was th things started to come together like you know as I stated had lost was about to lose the home had lost the vehicle all those things um, and those things started to come together. And so that, and it was, like I said, it was an, it was not a next day situation, but it didn't take long. It was maybe a few months, but it happened. It had, it was a beautiful transformation from that place in that bathtub to, you know, having our, being in a, with a roof over our head where I didn't have to worry about it, having our own vehicle, you know, not having to worry about my job now. And so, yeah, it, it the Lord literally showed himself with me. And that wow. and that's that's real, yeah. It's like they is they they say it jokingly, but it's so real. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Absolutely, he, he, will. he absolutely, absolutely will if if you allow yeah. him to. That's the key word. If you allow him, if to. you allow him to, that's right. And yeah. not allow him to according to the way that you want things to do, but according to his perfect will and plan for your life. I think absolutely. that's a lot of. I think that's a lot of. That's where a lot of us we we drop the ball because we want God to do things on our terms. We want things mm -hmm. to make things on, you know, make sense to us. When the, when the, the scripture tells mm -hmm. us that his ways are so far and above beyond what we could even ask or think. So right. why would I want God to come down to my level to give me what I want, as opposed right. to finding out how to tap into what it is that he wants for me? Yeah, that's it. You know, but that's, that's a whole it. different kind of conversation. I, I think a little bit <laughs> different than most people, you know. But I think that that's where that's the mindset that God all want us have it to, you know, mm -hmm. not just not Absolutely. just to be Christians, not to just be, uh, you know, love him, but to be the best version that we can be through him. Like we are living yeah. vessels, you know, yep. what good is a vessel that you just sit on a nightstand or just hang on top of the cabinet and you don't use it for anything like it's a pointless vessel. I want to be right. used to my capability, but I want to be more importantly, I want to be used for the way that you intend for me to be used. Absolutely. You know, if I'm if, I, if I'm a Kool-Aid pitcher, I don't want you putting gravy inside me. You know what I mean? Right. I right, want to right. I want to be used for my purpose. You know what I mean? But to get that purpose, I have to get it from him. Absolutely. Because he's the only one that knows that. I don't want to, I don't want him to give me the desires according to my heart. That's what's already in my heart. I want him right. to put into my heart what it is for me to desire for. Yeah. And, you know, and like we talked about, you know, we talked about it earlier, you know, that 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 comes with mindset. You know, people yeah. have to change their mindset. You know, Big Mama, she she did it this way, and she really loved the Lord and all that did. You know, one of the things that I, I joke about, you said that you didn't grow up in church, but I grew up in church. And I remember mm -hmm. growing up in church when I would consider what they called, the uh, I used to call them the lamp covers. When all the old mothers and the, mm. the real sanctified so-called people, they, they had what I call lamp covers on their head. They had to wear mm. like white dollies on top of their head. Mm. It was like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, you when you seen a dolly on your head, you know she was, she was, she was, she was, she was she wasn't playing. She wasn't no play right. playing. Like she, was, she was a soldier for God for real. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, mm. and it was like, you know, the 80s right. came around mm. and then the 90s mm. come around, you, you stopped seeing the dolly. You know what mm. I mean? I remember at, I remember when it was still a sin for women to wear pants in church. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. So it's like wow. This is this is things that we we grew I up. I would get kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> you feel me? Kicked out. <laughs> because you're from a different era and you you you're, you're from mm. a different mindset. But that's the right, way right. that's the way that they believed during that time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I get right. the discipline of that. I get that dis the discipline of that mm. because mm. on a personal level, I do feel that. Even even if I come back, even if I come to church and every Sunday with Tim's on and a throwback jersey, if that's my style or that's the way I feel comfortable with my relationship with God, and I ain't got to wear the suit and ties, I do feel like eventually. Well, I know put it like this. I'm gonna put it like I'm gonna use myself for example. 
Like I said, everybody is totally mm-hmm. different. I can remember at the time when I first became an ordained minister, like I said, mm-hmm. I had moved from Little Rock, Arkansas, and, you know, in Jersey, we serious about our barbers. You know what I mean? And I'm like, mm-hmm. I ain't letting none of these country boys cut my head. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, I think it was maybe about, I had been living there maybe about two or three years before I actually went to mm-hmm. a barbershop. Because I wasn't mm. going to trust them. I'm like, y'all ain't going to have me looking country. You know, that was just my <laughs> mindset, you know, from Jersey. And right. what I did was um, I started letting my hair grow out. And mm. during this time, you know, I would, I would find young ladies that could braid my hair and, you know, braid my hair, have it looking nice and neat. And I would shape mm. myself up, whatever. And I have got ordained. And one of the things that I, I, at that particular time in my life, I was real proud because I was like, yeah, guys, you know, I can show them. Like, you ain't got to be the three-piece suit dude, because at the time I was actually preaching. I was going places and I was preaching, and I would wear my suit and tie and all that day. I wasn't dressed like no b-boy, you know. You dress according to the job that you're called to do. If I'm in a minister's office, mm-hmm. I prefer if I'm going somewhere mm-hmm. to speak. That's just my personal thing. I, I wear all black suits. You know, people like to know that I like to gotcha. dress, but when, I, when I'm when i ministering the gospel, I don't want you to be focused on how nice my suit is or those some gangster mm-hmm. shoes right there. I want you to be focused on the words that are coming out of my mouth. So when I personally speak, I like to wear all black, you know, mm. when I would have my braids and I was like, I could show God these, you know, show these young fellas out here in the hood in Little Rock, you know, that, you know, you could look like this here, but you could really be about the, the father's business at the same time. Right. Mm-hmm. And one, one day, like I said, this is not doctrine. This is just something that God gave me on a personal level. Mm-hmm. And what he said was, he, 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 he was sitting in my living room, we had a conversation. He said, "What? What? what would, how would you feel if you came home today and the house, as soon as you put the key in the door and the house was smelling like Thanksgiving, just on an average Tuesday night, like you were going to be feeling good. You know, you're going to go in there, you're going to wash your hands and, you know, the wife, you had times to tell, you know, just sit on down and, you know, I'm going to prepare your plate, get the drink and everything ready. Cool. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that sound like this sound all right. <laughs> you know, I'm mm-hmm. about to get I'm about to get busy on this meal. And then when she shows up at the table, it's the same food that I've been smelling, but instead mm-hmm. of it being on a plate, it's on the top of a garbage lid. Mm-hmm. And it was like, mm-hmm. huh? Like, what are you saying, Lord? It was like, like that's what mm-hmm. you're doing. It's like you're you're polluting the way that I want to use you. I can mm. use you that way, and you can eat that good meal off of that garbage lid, but mm. for where I want you to be, I need you to look a certain way, because yeah. cer- certain places that I need you to go, even though there are people that you're going to reach, that you can that you, that I have for you to reach, looking like that, there's a higher calling to where I'm going to need you to meet more people in a different demographic, where they're not going to yeah. be able to perceive you looking like that. Right. So I didn't go to, the, I didn't get in the pulpit the next Sunday telling all brothers, you need to cut your braids or you need to call, cut your cornrows because mm. God can't mm. use you like that. No, that was something mm. that he gave me on a personal level. Right. You know what I mean? So then again, like my, my choice, like my post earlier today, you know, when I seen Jay, a Jay Prince interview, and he said it was so powerful, profound to me. It was like, that's one of the best things I've ever heard that wasn't like actually in the Bible. And he says, uh, you know, every day that we wake up, God give us two things, and that's a chance and a choice. And when you think about that, mm, yeah, that that it don't get no deeper than that because it's like that's a real thing. Like every day that He wakes us up, He gives us another chance to make yeah. the right choice. You know, mm-hmm. you know what 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 we what the the choices that we make are going to do dictate what we did with that chance, but it doesn't yeah. negate one doesn't negate the other. So we need to be mindful of that, and every day we need to be seeking. Okay, Father, how can I please you today? You know, yeah. how can I, what, what it is, what, who do you have for me to minister to today? And when I began to embrace that or that mindset, it wasn't no big thing. Like, I cut my hair off. It wasn't no problem. I, I didn't have no, mm-hmm. and it was the first time. I mean, I'm talking about a dude that was vain. I was very conceited in high school. Mm-hmm. All my mm-hmm. class, I remember, it took me about 30 minutes in the morning to do my hair. I had to make sure that the S-curl was just right. Flat top, you know what I mean? I got a, I got right. evidence to hold. I was one of those, dudes, but when God, when it came from God, I have no, I had no mm-hmm. problem at all. I went and got mm-hmm. some. Money. 
And I had never, ever in my life wanted to be bald, but that's exactly what I did, mm-hmm. just like the Bible. I shaved my mm-hmm. head, I shaved my beard, I, I went completely bald because mm-hmm. I wanted to show God how committed I was doing what it is that he wanted me to do. Wow. Not on my terms, but the terms that you give me to do more. And Absolutely. I'm always thinking for that. And, you know, I, I, I don't take that lightly. So I applaud you. And, and like I said, in your candidness and all that there. But speaking on that there, um, I asked you about it yesterday, but I kind of wanted you to talk about that because I know there's people out here that's viewing, you know, they uh, you said that you're a single mom of two girls, twins. Mm-hmm. And I know that there are a lot of single moms out here that, that are watching. And first of all, let me say, I, I applaud you ladies. I applaud not just you ladies, but I applaud all single parents, period. Yeah. Because I do know male single parents that are holding it down. You know, my boy Michael, he's one of my heroes. He's been holding this down. His wife passed away years ago and mm-hmm. one of the best fathers in the world. And I always applauded him for that. Like, he, he's one of the guys that I look up to. He's one of my heroes. And, you know, so I applaud all single parents. But what is it like for you as a single mom, um, single mom at the time, future wife, as you said earlier, uh, That's right. to have two daughters <laughs> that are mm-hmm. watching you? How does, how, do, how does being a mom, so to speak, or being a role model, how do you feel that it impacts or affects your daily walk or your relationship with God? Okay. If that makes sense to you. And give it to me one more time. Like for you, how, how does that feel? How does it impact or affect your relationship with God having two young women that are watching you, knowing that, you know, they're watching you, so to speak? Does right. that how, how does your relationship with God affect your motherhood, so to speak? Right. And so um, one of the things when, and again, this is personal, right? Um, I acknowledge God in all my ways, period. I acknowledge him even in me raising my daughters because um, I shared prior that I was a fiance. Um, I was a mom, but at the time I didn't know who I was as a woman. And so when God saved me, when I gave my life to Christ, that was one of the things he dealt with me on was my identity, who I was, how I was not valuing myself and how he viewed me, right? And so he had to work on me in the core of who I am and who he has always called me to be. And so in the midst of that, he's cultivated such a way that that I, I know who I am. And that also is what protrudes out of me when it comes to my daughters. And so I hold myself at a standard because I know that my daughters are watching. They watch everything I do. And so with that being said, because your children mimic mimic you, they watch you. Um, It's always been important to me to make sure that I'm mindful of what I do. I'm mindful of what I say. Um, and when I'm wrong, I apologize for it. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, and I think that's just the way God deals with me concerning my children. The Bible says to train your children up in a way that they are to take so that as they grow older, they won't depart from it. And so even though my childhood was, um, broken and, you know, I went down different paths of life. I've always said my children will not go through what I went through. And, um, I shared with you yesterday uh, that I kind of look at myself, um, if any of y'all know, you know, David's story, David was a warrior, right? He fought, he fought battle after battle in the Bible, but the Bible says that when his son Solomon became king, he had rest on every side. He didn't have to fight no battles that he sat on his throne and people came to him to hear his wisdom. And so for me, I've always said I'm fighting every battle because when my children get to their spot, they gonna have rest on every side because mom fought every battle. And so that's my mindset. Of course, I set them up. Of course, I tell them about real life experience. I don't sugarcoat anything. I speak to my children and I tell them the truth and I raise them up in God. Um, because I didn't have that as a kid. And so that is what, um, that's the way I train my children up. God is literally my help. He's my help. He's my, he literally is my, our provider, period. And I, and, and so I have, I know where my help comes from. I think that's what really keeps me together. I know where my help comes from. 
I like that. And I and I also applaud it because that that's real deep what you just said. You know, to me that that's that takes a big person and, and someone that's humble. Humble and really care about their relationship with God because I could be honest and you know, like I said, part of my thing is being transparent. Like I really currently don't have a relationship with my oldest son. But at the end of the day, I sleep good at night because I know I did what I was supposed to do. I raised him. My, my problem was I raised him up like the Bible said. I raised him up in the things of God and how he should be raised. The mm-hmm. problem was, even though I raised him that way and taught him those things, I didn't show him those things. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Here it is. And, and I'm quite sure we, we've never had that conversation, but I know probably one of the my oldest son's biggest issues with me is like, dude, how can you know what you know? How could God use you? Why he has used you in people's lives and in your life and just in times of the past, but you choose to be just a regular dude. You just choose to be a pothead and you just choose to be drink all day. You know, those are the choices that you make. How can you make those choices when you know better, Hmm. you know? And, you know, my mom used to tell me something that growing up and the older I get, I appreciate it and understand it more every single day. You know, she used to, sometimes I would ask questions and she would just say, keep on living. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's not mm-hmm. that's not no excuse. You know what I mean? Right. I, I own my errors of my ways because I should have been not just t- teaching you or telling you how to live for God. I should have been showing you. You know, like I talked to you about before the show started, you know, my spiritual dad, my uncle, my bishop, James H. Everett, like this man, he showed me in the pulpit, outside of the pulpit, at the house, mm-hmm. at the hotel. In the car, it was he showed me what holiness is. He mm. showed me that it can be done. You yeah. know, I I hate to hear those mistakes. Well, you know, I'm only human. You know, I'm gonna make mistakes along the way. Doesn't mean that I'm not driving. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, or people like to say uh, nobody's perfect. Mm. That's true in theory, but I, I I beg to disagree. I agree to disagree. And the reason mm. that I say that is because. Paul tells us that we need to be striving toward perfection. I feel like if yeah. if, there, if if something is not achievable, th- it wouldn't be a need to be going after it. Mm-hmm. But if he tells us to strive for perfection, it doesn't mean that we're ever going to reach perfection. But there is a place in perfection that you can get to if you strive right. for it. Right. You know what I mean? Nobody's going to tell you to work towards something that is totally irrelevant to you. So I understand that technically none of us will ever be perfect, but we're by, we're not we will never reach perfection according to whose standard, according to whose definition. Right. There is a level of per- perfection that I believe that personally I can reach in God to where I get to be where exactly He wants me to be. You yeah. know what I mean? But that's a whole that that's that's a, that's another thing. I'm sorry, I ain't even good to get on that little. No, bit. no, you good. <laughs> <laughs> but and I think that's with all of us, right? Um, mm-hmm. What I, I was when you were talking, I thought about. Um, he who has begun to go work in you shall perform it to the day, you know, shall perfect it to the day Absolutely. of Christ Jesus. So it's God who perfects you. That's one of the things when it comes to me. Um, I remember when I first um, got saved and, um, you know, I have family members who aren't saved and they'll be like, you know, I, I, I'll come to God when I'm done smoking weed. I'll come to God when, when mm-hmm. you know, I stop drinking. And I'm like, God wants you right there. He wants you right there. You, you, those are things that he wants you right with that, with that blunt in your hand. He wants you with that alcohol in your hand, because guess what? He is going to perfect you. Come he will take that about. He will literally take that taste out of your mouth. You know what I'm saying? And so he perfects us. You know what I'm saying? As we continue to walk with him. And so it's, it's, a, it's an everyday Somebody said every an everyday deliverance, you know, but again, mm-hmm. it's a choice too. Like you said, mm-hmm. we have a chance and we have a choice. And so you have to make that choice to want God to perfect you, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm sorry for the people that, that ain't here in the back. I got to expound on that a little bit because one that's one of the things that God gave me personally. And I shared it on one of the previous shows is, you know, God, God says, listen, I'm with, as long as your heart is right, I hate people always saying that too. Like, well, God know my heart. It ain't enough to know your heart. Like, right. 
you got to still do stuff on your part. Yeah, your heart yeah. might be in the right place, but if you ain't living nothing or doing nothing to back up, your actions aren't backing up what you're saying in your heart, then it's null and void. Yeah. You know, but one of the things that God God gave me on the same thing, because I used to be one of those type of people too. Mm. And I, when I hear it, I always discourage people from saying stuff like that. Did. Because if you would give up the, well, I won't, I, I'm trying to keep it clean because I know we got spiritual viewers. But if you could, if you could give up being promiscuous, mm -hmm. if you would give up sleeping around, if you would give up right. the one night stands and adultery, whatever the case you may be, if you would give up the weed, if you could give up that loud, if you could give up the meth or the coke or the Jack Danes, whatever, whatever your vice is, right. if you could give that up on your own, what would you need God for? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. What would you need him for? Because if you could get all that together on your own, there's no reason to come to him after the fact because you done did everything that you need to do on, in your own strength. You need to come to him when you got that quarter, that eighth habit of day, that's when you need to come to him because it's bigger than him. And yeah. then guess what? When he delivers you from it, guess what? Tamika knows, Marvin knows that I had nothing to do with, with all with my own deliverance. Nobody right. but God could do this because if I could have stopped smoking, I would have did it years ago. Right. But I couldn't. That's why I had to come to him. Mm -hmm. He said, cast your cares at my feet. Cast your cares at the altar. And the right. thing is, I think of where a lot of us fall short is and what we mess up at is we cast our cares on the altar. But when we get in, when we get up and we go back to our seat, guess what? Take we take them right back with us. Right. We don't leave them there. You know what I'm saying? That's what the altar is for. You're supposed to leave that there. Mm -hmm. You walk them back to your seat. That's a new creature. That's a new creature, right. creature in, your, in Christ. So it's just another opportunity. So. Right. Like you say, man, don't don't stop all that, man. Let's, once I get it together, you ain't going to never get it. I'm, I'm here to tell you, you're never going to get it together. Right. You are never going to get it together because there's always going to be something. The devil yeah. is busy. And I try to tell people all the time, when the devil ain't doing nothing but fighting. You can't get mad at somebody for doing their job. Right. That's what his job yeah, right. is. And the minute that you become aware and actually care about your relationship with God and being used by God the way that he wants you to, I can promise you this. I can assure you the devil is going to raise all hell that he possibly can in your life. Because you got to realize people, I tell people all the time, they're like, well, it seemed like as soon as I came to Christ, I remember me personally. I remember <laughs> when I, when I first moved to Little Rock, I was still drinking forties all day, you know, maybe drink like two or three forties a day. And mm -hmm. you know, in Jersey, it was a it was a forty cost you two fifty. And I get the little rock, the forties was ninety nine cents. So I'm like, oh my god, blessings from Ohio. It's like buy one get one free. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was getting it in on my forty, and it was like, it was also at the time where I had a made up mind. So and it was like no matter where I would go, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Beer was on sale, liquor was on sale, stuff mm -hmm. that not not everything, just mm -hmm. stuff that I like. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The Remy is is five dollars cheaper now. All of a sudden, that I, mm. I, I want to give up drinking. You know, got the weed dude coming through. Hey man, just just try this out, man. What I owe wow. you? Man. Good. Let me let me know mm -hmm. what this tastes like. Let me know what you think of this is. Right. <laughs> the devil just handing it to you. Exactly. Like... He's just doing his job. Right. So in it, part, like you say, that discipline is making the choice to right. do right because God tells us it's already within mm -hmm. us. You just got to tap into it. The same right. way you got a choice, the same way I had a choice to say, you know what, get, get out here. I'm going to let you know what it tastes like when I finish. I got the mm -hmm. same, the same way, same, I can make the same choice or I, got, I have the same right to make the choice. You know what, man, I appreciate it, bro, but I ain't about that life no more. You know what I'm right. saying? I gave that up. But yep. that's a certain level of discipline that we need God Almighty for. But we yeah. have to be open enough to ask him for the strength in that. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we, we um we kind of we covered the motherhood. We covered the 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 personal um uh, the personal experience of coming to God. Um, I kind of want to go from from there before we wrap up. I want to go from because I want to put that out there. Like we don't know each other. 
I wouldn't necessarily consider us like real friends, but you're you're the type of person that I would want to be a friend with. In other words, what I mean is we don't know each other other than conversations that we had, other than passing and going. Right. We don't really know each other. We know who each other are, but we don't really know each other. All right. So having said that, I know that one of the things that I kind of recall was around that time when you were leaving here in North Carolina and going to mm-hmm. Texas, I considered that a big step out on faith. Because if, I, if I'm not mistaken, you wasn't sure about the situation in Texas, exactly where you was going, how that thing was going to work out. Um, kind of share that a little bit with with the people. Ooh, y'all. <laughs> so I'm in Texas right now, and so this has just been it, it's it's been divine. It has not been easy, and so um, how can I say it? So, like I said before, we moved to North before I moved to North Carolina with my cousin. Um, the desire to move to Texas was in my heart I had never been to Texas before I didn't know anybody out here no nothing it was just a desire that was in my heart but like I said I moved to North Carolina and um, I had been in North Carolina for four years and things that I was trying to do the doors weren't opening for me and I remember being uh, my little spot is always between my closet doors with my little prayer pillow. And I remember just talking to God and I was just talking to him like, man, why are these things not happening for me? And it wasn't like this big voice or, you know, an audible voice, but I had this knowing in my spirit, like I'm not planting you here. And when I had that knowing, during my four years of being in North Carolina, I forgot all about Texas because I was trying to make everything happen in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, when I had that knowing that I was not, he was not planning me in North Carolina, everything about Texas came back, right? And so I I remember just sitting on that pillow and I'm like, Lord, well, I don't, what's in Texas? Like, I don't know nobody out there. Why, you know, I don't have family or any of that. And so um, this was around the time I was about to publish my first book. And um, I remember sharing this with my cousins, like, you know, I, I, need, I need to go visit Texas. I need to at least go scope out the land, right? And so um, I remember during that time, I was kind of going back and forth because I'm trying to publish my book, trying to plan a trip to Texas. And so I ended up putting that trip on hold. And so I released my book, had a big, um, had a big uh, book release in North Carolina. And for my birthday, my cousin surprised me, surprised me with a round trip ticket to Texas. And so that came out of nowhere. Um, not only that, I was just now when I say this, like, for real, I have like these encounters where I just know that this guy and so I'm at work. And, you know, Texas is huge. Like, Texas is big. I I didn't know where I was going. I just knew Austin, Dallas, and Houston were like the top three that I heard people talk about. And I kid you not, I remember being in an exam room at my job, and I wrote Austin on one piece of paper. I wrote Dallas on another, and I wrote Houston on one. And I balled them up, right? And I just took them in my hand, and I shook them like dice. And I was just like, whichever paper, now this is real. (laughs) I said, whichever paper, falls in front of me, that's where I'm a god. And so when I did that, in a paper that fell in front of me, it was like a modern day of casting of a lot. You know, if you know anything about casting a lot, that's spoken in the Bible. So anyway, I opened it up and the paper said Austin. And I was like, okay, well, Austin it is. I'm gonna go visit Austin. And so um, fast forward, like I said, my cousins buy me the plane ticket to Austin. And then I'm at work. And I'm at my desk and long story short, there's this resident who was following, who was shadowing the doctor I was working with and him and I had not really talked like that during the week he was there. And so I'm at my desk and I'm looking at this event that was happening at a church on my email. And you know how you feel somebody kind of looking over your shoulder? He, I felt, I felt somebody looking over my shoulder and I look back and it's him. And he's like, what are you looking at? And I was like, oh, it's a church event. And so he's like, okay, well, what church you go to? So that kind of started conversation with us. And um, he ended up asking me where I was from because he didn't hear a North Carolina accent. And so that sparked me to ask him where he was from. And he says, Texas. And I was like, really? So what part of Texas? And he says, Austin. 
And so it let, I, I kid you not, I kid you not. And it just, it began to happen like that. It began to happen like that. And so had the plane ticket um, and literally just stepped out on faith, got to Austin. Um, then I booked a hotel room, um, started just sightseeing, just checking it out. And a year later ended up stepping out on faith and just moving. Wow. That is, and that's, that's a short. That's, like awesome. <laughs> that, that's awesome though. That's and, a short. And, Seventeen boxes <laughs> and a word from the Lord <laughs> is what I moved on. And at the time, did was it? Do I, I'm trying to, I'm trying because I'm trying to remember correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you, I, you didn't even have a. Was it? Did, did, did you have a car at that time, or you just had a U-Haul? And your boxes no, and your I order? actually ended up blessing somebody with my truck that I had. I gave that away again. That was right before you left, right? God led, huh? Right before you left, right? Right before I left, uh huh. So yeah, I, so I didn't so, have a U-Haul. I just shipped seventeen boxes and had a plane ticket. So what? What? What was that about? I'm moving to another state. I'm a single mom. I got two girls to look after. What in? I'm going to use regular words. What in your right mind will make you think to give away a vehicle while you're moving out of state where you know you don't know anyone? Right. So I think, so, okay. So this is where I got to go a little bit deeper, right? So I had come to visit Texas and I knew that God was leading me to move, but I didn't. I didn't at that time. And um, every door opened for me. A job opportunity was given for me. And I wasn't even looking for a job. Mind you, I was just going to go visit. But a job opportunity presented itself while I was there for just two days. No, for three days. So job opportunity happened where they offered me the job and wanted me to start in two weeks. I didn't have my children at the time. They were in Minnesota with family. I didn't have much in North Carolina. I could have made the move work. Me and my cousin's lease was up. It, it, it could have worked, but I feared, I had doubts, um, and I wasn't sure if I was hearing them right. Talking to other people, like, you know, I feel like the Lord's leading me to do this, but what do you think? Mm -hmm. And hearing them say, oh, I believe the Lord's moving you, but not right now. And I heard that from people whose advice I really take to heart, you know? And so I'm like, okay, well, maybe the Lord's not moving me, right? And so I don't move. I turn down the position. I re-sign a lease with my cousin for another year. And I stay in North Carolina. Well, three months later, I lose my job in North Carolina. And when that happened, it was like a slap in the face. Well, I hate to say a slap in the face, but it was like the Lord was like, I told you to move. Mm -hmm. Like, that's literally how I felt. Yeah. And so I go through this 40 days. I call it my wilderness experience because that's literally what it was. I went through 40 days without a job. And um, then he eventually opened up an opportunity for me. And after that, um, once I got my job, I'm at church, right? I'm at the church where we were members of together. And nobody, nobody knows about God telling me to move to Texas. I shared some pictures of my visit, but otherwise the only people who knew was my, my close circle. Yeah. And so I am on duty. I'm holding the offering basket. And as I'm holding the offering basket, one of the brothers at church who I'm cool with, but we don't know each other like that, right? Mm -hmm. He calls my name and he says, God's not, move, God's not removing things to hurt you. He's removing things to get your attention. Absolutely. And then he said, God told you, God said, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to move. Just like that. And I'm holding the offering basket, Marvin. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. What? What? <laughs> What you just say? And so he's like, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to move. And so now pastor, pa pastor is telling us that it's time for us to go in the middle. I give the offering basket back. And I'm like, man, I got to find him after church. And so after church, I hunt him down. And I'm like, do you remember anything you said to me? And he was like, yeah, come walk with me. So I start walking with him. And as soon as he turns around, he points his finger at me. And he says, God told you to move and you didn't. And he said to me, you were listening to what everyone else had to say. And that was out of order. Just like that, Marvin. Wow. And in that moment, in that moment, I knew God was telling me to go. And so right. when he gave me that rebuke, 
but he also gave me correction and encouragement all at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, only things that me and uh, that I talked to God about in my prayer closet, he gave me a word about when he talked to me. That is what made me move, period. It didn't matter what my logic mind said. It was out of faith of God speaking through that man to me that then ignited a level of faith in me to go. And so when that happened, I said, I don't care what it looked like. Obviously, Lord, there's a reason why you want me in Texas and I need to obey you. I need to obey you. I disobeyed the first time. And so obviously you want me here. I'm a step out in radical obedience and I pray that you, you uh, honor it. <laughs> and so that is what made me move. It wasn't a logic move because believing in Christ is not logic, it's by faith. And so when that happened to me though, that was the word I had. And that's what made me move. Well, isn't that a beautiful thing that God's love for us is so unconditional that even when we hear him and we turn a deaf ear, he loves us enough to still send a voice of reason, a voice of confirmation. Even when sometimes we know it's God and we're still a little unsure, he'll send that confirmation from, like you say, right. a ram in a bush, somebody that you don't have any relationship with. Right. And, and one of the people, one of the things I used to hear a lot of the times at the church was no i mean you know well everybody that get to know me later on they would always say that they thought i was me you know because i don't talk to people i don't do the clicks you know mm -hmm. what i mean i mm -hmm. speak and i keep it moving mm -hmm. but a lot of that was i know my role in god i know my mm -hmm. role as a prophet so i don't like to get too close to people because when i give you something like that there you know that is not based off our relationship, our personal mm -hmm. relationship, or a conversation that we've had previously. Mm -hmm. You know, even the, even the guys that everybody say, well, he different. He always is talking to them. Most of the time, either the guys that you see me with on a consistent basis, we either talking mm -hmm. two things. We either talking music or we talking sports. Mm -hmm. We ain't talking mm -hmm. nothing personal. You know what I mean? Right. Because I need you to know, as my friend and as my brother, when I say that the Lord says such and such, you trust me and you trust God enough to know that. That's exactly where it's coming from. That's not coming right. from something that I shared with Marv already, or he might just be giving me his opinion. No, I like the fact that I love giving words to people that I have no idea what it is that I'm saying, because it's, it's nothing like, everybody can't relate to it, but it's nothing like that awkwardness to me. Yeah. Because I see people all the time, I'm like, I don't, I'm never, I, I'm way past the stage of, well, Lord, do you really want me to say that? I just mm. say what he tell me to say, because in the beginning it was like that there. Mm. but it got to the place where I just say it, but at the same time that I'm saying it, it's like if you was to ask me not outside outside of the spiritual realm, if you was to ask me in the natural why am I saying the things that I'm saying, I'm going to tell you, I have no idea I don't even know if they're right mm. Mm. I don't know, I have no mm. idea I'm just telling you, I'm just a messenger I'm right, just giving it right. to you like he give it to me but right. it goes back to the earlier part of the conversation that we were saying. We have to get to a place where we're, you're not special. I mean, you are special, but you know what I mean? But right. Yeah, God is no respect of person. Yeah. You know, you're not special. I'm not special. God wants to use us all as vessels. Absolutely. But we have to be in a position, in a place, the way he can use us for the vessels that he desires to fill it up. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and we, we got to be submissive to that. And, and I, I, I want to commend you before I wrap up. I, I want to tell you, that's one of the reasons that um, spiritually you are one of my heroes. Mm -hmm. Because I remember watching that from a distance. I appreciate that. That whole encounter. And it was like, I remember, I, I won't even say who I did was, but I had, I had a conversation with somebody that knew you. I'm like, See, she just gave a car away. Ain't she about to move? And I'm like, yo, naturally, that don't make sense. But at the same right. time, it was like, you know what? That's why that's why I rock with her because that's 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 spiritually gangster to me. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about it a little bit last night, but years ago, a guy named Prophet Voss, Gregory Voss came to the church that we were attending together there. Doing mm -hmm. North Carolina. And one of the things that he said that always stuck with me, stayed in my spirit, and I try to make sure that even if I get amnesia, I will never forget that. Mm -hmm. He said, God wants us to get to a place 
where we're operating in zero unbelief. Mm. Now you go, mm. you can you can define it however you want to, but zero right. unbelief mm-hmm. means absolute faith in Marvin Bennett's opinion. Yeah. Because Absolutely. he even talked about it that night. You know, a lot of us, you know, some of these preachers, you got preachers, bona fide preachers, men that love the Lord, that we look up to and that we revere, but they only operating on 60% faith. Right. They only operating on 80% faith. Mm-hmm. Some of us, we only operating on 30% faith. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But to get to the point where we're actually zero unbelief, mm-hmm. to me, that's the most absolute faith. And I believe that is vital and is pivotal because what does Hebrews 11 tell us? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things yep. not seen. Right. Three verses later, it tells us without faith, it is impossible to please him. Yep. So that lets me know I got to believe in some things that don't make sense. Right. Yep. I tell people all the time, you got to be, you got to be real careful about your spiritual leaders. Mm-hmm. You know, how you talk to them about the, the, the sand, not saying that you shouldn't talk to your pastor. You should, but be mm-hmm. careful with that. At the end of the day, make sure you talking to God if you ain't talking to nobody else. Yeah. You know, that's first and foremost, because one of the things that I, I loved <laughs> about my relationship with my spiritual dad, my bishop that passed away mm-hmm. was no matter what it was in my life that I was up against the wall, I prayed about it, but I was still, I still want to know what he had to say about it. Mm-hmm. I want to know how you feel about it. Mm-hmm. And I cannot but tell you in one time in my life, whether it was personal or spiritual, that he ever told me what he thought. Mm-hmm. The very first response that he always had every single time was, we're going to pray about it and see what God got to say. Yep. Never, well, this is what I think you should do, but we're going to pray about it. It's mm-hmm. always no. It ain't even no need to tell you how I feel about this thing if God is telling you something totally different. So we're going to pray about it first. We're going to hear what God got to say. Then we're yep. going to revisit the situation. There you go. Yep. And that is so pivotal. I value that so much. And I try to be that for my friends and others. But seeing you, and I've, I've never shared this with you personally before, but you are one of my spiritual sheroes. I don't care whether you have a title. I don't care whether you, whatever the case may be, you are a person of faith. Or when, I, when I think of women in faith, you are mm. one of my heroes because I do remember that. Like, you Amen. moved to Texas completely on faith Mm -hmm. and i don't never remember you panicking well god are you sure (laughs) is this gonna work is (laughs) you 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 say you know what god look i'm a ride or die with you if this is what you said first of all i wasn't obedient the first time i didn't move the first time you said you gave me another opportunity i want to take advantage of you and i'm not going to second guess you and that is hard for so many of us to do. So I want to applaud you on that. I want to applaud you on that. And I want to let you know, and I'm quite sure that it's not just inspiration and motivation to me, but also to other people in your life, your family that you talk about. Um, People that, like other people, we like I said, we we haven't had many conversations. We had a Mm -hmm. handful of conversations personally in our lives, but I'm sure I'm I'm not the only one that was watching. I'm sure I'm not the only one that was seeing. And at at the same time, what it was was you was using God, allowing God to use you as a vessel to say, you know what, God has no respect to person. If he could go with and lead Tamika in this type of way, then he he might be able to do the same thing for me. I might yeah. be able to get out of my situation. Yeah. I want to applaud you for that, and I thank you for that because once again, with that chance, we all get a chance with the day, each day that we see, but we don't always make the choice to do the right thing with that chance. Mm. So I want to I want to appreciate you and let you know that. You doing what you did, the cha- the choices that you made with your chance, is it go- it doesn't go unnoticed. Amen. No one else tell you that. I don't want to tell you that. And I, I respect you, that. and I love you for that. And I, I appreciate. I'm always praying for you. I'm always rooting for you. Um, Thank you. 
as we wrap out, is there anything that you feel there to share or did you want to give a word of prayer or just anything you want to leave the people with? Uh, just to believe God, believe God. If you hear God talking to you and you know that he's telling you to do something, just step out in faith and do it. Um, I believe that how we increase in faith is by exercising our faith. You know, the Bible says faith, uh, you know, as long as you have faith that's as small as a mustard seed, that you can move a mountain. And so that to me tells me how, how amazing faith is, how just how strong it is. And so even if you operate off that little faith you have, God will continue to increase your level of faith, but believe him, whatever he's telling you to do, just do it. Just stop to step out in faith and do it. Yeah. The doubt may be there. Yeah. The fear may be there, but do it anyway. And just believe that he is going to meet you there. Period. Absolutely. That's it. <laughs> Absolutely. But with that being said, it ain't much left to say, man. I do appreciate you. I thank you for your time. Thank um, you. One more time, all you people that are viewing, people that have left comments in the view, if you're interested in the books, give them the titles of the books again. Yeah, so I have Given Beauty for Ashes and Crazy Faith. They are my memoir series, which is my life, my story, God's glory. They are available on Amazon. All right. So if anybody, anybody want to find out, go out, go out there and support them. I guarantee you it's a good read. It's going to bless you. Um, and like I said, I thank you for your time again. I thank you for doing this. Thank you. I truly appreciate it. I um, appreciate you too. We've got it in the comments. So yeah, you know, people reach out to the comments and if y'all want to talk to uh, any, anybody, anybody that this, this episode is, uh, blessed or ministered to us any kind of way, or you might have some questions that you might not feel comfortable putting in the comments. Um, I didn't check with you beforehand, but I'm quite sure. When it comes to things that that's helping people spiritually, you won't mind them reaching out to you. So I would encourage oh, you no, guys to do that. You know what I mean? I tell y'all all the time. I'm I'm single now again, so I I don't I'm not one of those people who stay out of my deal. I I welcome all deals. You know, hopefully they all spiritual. Both of them are spiritual anyway. <laughs> but I welcome all deal invitation, <laughs> prayer requests, all kind of requests. So, <laughs> but that's just me. But ser on a serious note. If this was a blessing to you, please reach out to my sister, support her by buying her books. And if nothing else, keep her in your prayers. Amen. As she continues to allow God to use her and do the things that God has created to meet the Marie to do. Amen. Amen. I love you. I thank you. Love you I too. God you. bless you. Thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. You're more than welcome. And as usual, in signing off, until next week, DeAndre and Lysa know that daddy loves you unconditionally. But I also love you intentionally. Till next week, peace.